Hello, everyone. I am just waiting for the room to fill, seeing all the participants come through. Well, hello, everyone. My name is Paloma Zapata, and I am CEO of Sustainable Travel International. And welcome to our second session of the webinar series, Roadmap to Net Zero. On today's topic, we will discuss blue carbon and how tourism can protect these critical coastal carbon sinks. So let's talk about coastal ecosystems. There are three coastal ecosystems that are highly effective at sequestering carbon dioxide, which are mangroves, seagrass, and salt marshes. They ca the carbon capture and storage of these coastal ecosystems is known as blue carbon. And pound for pound, these blue carbon ecosystems can hold up 10 times more carbon than tropical rainforests. Blue carbon ecosystems not only prevent climate change, but they also protect coastal communities from the negative impacts such as rising sea level, storm surge, and providing essential habitats for marine life. But sadly, tourism development has contributed to destroying these incredible ecosystems at an alarming rate. So here to talk to us today on how we can protect these important ecosystems are three field experts with unique expertise. So welcome, Philippa Rowe, Carbon, um, Group Manager of Regenerative Impact at Six Senses Hotels and Resorts, and Robin Schilland, um, Director of the Association of Coastal Ecosystem Services, ACES, and Mohamed Kasim Juma. So he's a project manager of Mikoko Pamoja at um, project, a project of ACES. So before we start, we have a quick poll that we're going to be sharing with you to help us better understand the audience today. Um, so it's just a quick little poll that is going to be sent. And if you can just take um, a couple of seconds to, um, to answer that, and then we can move on. Okay. Do we have results? Excellent. Um, okay, so we have a mixed group, but this is this is excellent to know. So you are going to learn a lot about uh, blue carbon ecosystems. So this is the right um, session for you. And as well as um, you're going to learn more about how to get involved in climate finance. So thank you for answering this poll. Now, let's talk uh, a little bit more on what is blue carbon and why does it matter? Robin, you've worked in conservation of blue carbon ecosystems for over a decade. Can you tell us more about these fantastic ecosystems and why they're called the secret weapon in the fight against climate change? Oh, oh sorry about that. <laughs> Thanks very much and thank you for having me as part of the webinar. I'm really delighted to be here and really great to see so many people from all over the world, including in Kenya, where um, our projects are. So I'm really excited to be speaking here. Um, so yeah, blue carbon, in its broadest sense, it is the carbon that's in the oceans, um, and that can include animals, plants, phytoplankton, all of the, the, the kind of living beings in the ocean that sink carbon. But as Paloma mentioned at the start, the three main blue carbon ecosystems are mangrove forests, seagrass meadows and salt marshes. So mangroves grow in tropical to trop subtropical um, environments and salt seagrass and salt marsh both grow in tropical to temperate um, environments. And their main um, kind of superpower as ecosystems is sinking huge volumes of carbon from the atmosphere. So for example, seagrass uh, covers about 0.1% of the world's oceans, but it also contains about 10 to 18% of all the carbon that is stored in the oceans, which is absolutely huge. Um, so yeah, um, Mangroves, uh, both mangroves and seagrass and, and salt marshes act as, as kind of uh, coastal defences. So 
when waves, waves and storms, tsunamis, hurricanes, all these kind of pressures on from the, the sea onto the coast hit the coastline, these, these habitats buffer the, the coastline from that, that pressure. So they protect the coast and its inhabitants from um, sea level rise and, and coastal erosion. And they act as, um, as kind of biodiversity hotspots. Um, they're huge for fisheries, including uh, kind of crustaceans and fin fish. Um, other bigger animals, things like birds, uh, mammals as well. In, in places you get the, uh, huge kind of megafauna, charismatic megafauna like tigers live there. So they're also great for uh, both fisheries and for uh, biodiversity tourism. So they're these yeah, incredible, um, incredible habitats that deliver a huge number of benefits to people and the environment. Thank you for that. And that really leads well into my next question for Philippa. You have led the Maldives Underwater Initiative for six census resorts for almost five years. So from your experience, why is it essential for the tourism industry to get involved in protecting blue carbon ecosystems? Are they a necessary part of the um, experience in itself? And um, have you actually seen these um, ecosystems actually being destroyed by tourism development? And um, yeah, again, thank you for inviting me to talk about this. Seagrass is a topic very close to my heart in particular. Um, and I'd first like to say by acknowledging that it's not just blue carbon ecosystems that are vital to tourism industry, but it's all the natural habitats in that where that operation is situated. Um, whether it's like the beautiful view or the activities you can do in those habitats. However, blue carbon ecosystems haven't historically been seen as an asset especially in comparison to coral reefs and um, forests or mountains. If you imagine like maybe a swampy mangrove or a mangrove that's blocking direct access to the sea, um, this is a lot of the reputation the blue carbon ecosystems um, get. So that's some of the challenges from the, from the tourism industry. And my primary example today is going to be from the Maldives, which is where I spent a lot of time. And that's where my first hand example will come from. Um, it's also a location where the product that is marketed is white sandy beaches and crystal clear lagoons. And um, it's also a country where the Ministry of Tourism there since um, in 2018, they actively advocated the removal of seagrass from the lagoons in order to say that your tourism uh, establishment should be successful because they didn't agree with the seagrass. Um, and remember, at this time, um, knowledge of seagrass in Maldives is, is quite low. There was no scientific publications of seagrass in Maldives. There's no national monitoring of seagrass. Um, it just wasn't considered a key habitat. Um, but blue carbons have like extensive like benefits for biodiversity, as Robin said, for wildlife as well. And that's why guests should really love it and enjoy it. Guests can act of, like initially see the wildlife right in front of the, their shores rather than just a clear sandy lagoon. Um, the differences in biodiversity are just catastrophic between no seagrass and seagrass. Um, and in addition to that, the coastal protection, many tourism establishments are on the seafront and this additional coastal protection will help them continue to be there in the future, even with sea level rise or increasing storms and things like that as well. Um, and then of course, you've got the other benefit of the carbon sequestration. Um, any additional carbon emissions that because of maybe limits in technology or limits in capacity that can't be reduced or eliminated, you've got that opportunity to use these blue carbon ecosystems as a way to accommodate those additional emissions that we have from the tourism industry. Um, and I think finally, it's additionally important because tourists are even more environmentally aware now. Um, they're not just happy knowing that their money isn't not causing damage, but they want to know that their money is having a positive impact. So um, that's where restoration can come into play. That's where protection can come into play. And blue carbon ecosystems are one of the ones where it's most needed. And that can be another benefit to the, to the tourism industry as well. Thank you. That's that's excellent. I can, you know, just I was just picturing myself swimming with the turtles in the seagrass, <laughs> you know, in the Maldives <laughs> as you were speaking. Um, so Kasim, thank you for being here. You have a background in coastal and marine resource management, and you manage that the Mikoko Pomoja project in your homeland, Gazi Bay, Kenya. Can you explain your firsthand experience and the importance of maintaining these healthy mangrove ecosystems for the local community? And can you tell us more about how the Mikoko Pamoja project actually does that? Thank you, Paloma. 
Uh, I think we all know that mangroves are incredibly important for environmental and economic reasons. They do provide habitat for a wide variety of terrestrial and marine species. These species, most of the species, um, are critical not only in maintaining health ecosystem, but also supporting local diets and also fishing industry. Unfortunately, these are mangroves, they play a critical role in fighting the effect of climate change mitigation as they highly effective in storing carbon in their biomass and in the soil beneath them. Unfortunately, mangroves, they undergo a serious threat in the world due, uh, due to combination of uh, uh, natural causes and uh, uh, human causes, like the issue of deforestation, climate change, and land use change. These big effects have led to significantly loss of biodiversity, decreased carbon storage, and uh, reduced coastal, coastal protection from storms, floods, and uh, erosion. Mikokopamoja works to address these issues by addressing communities, by addressing community, by providing incentive to the local communities. Mikokopamoja is a community-based organization that focuses on restoration and protection of mangroves through the sale of high-quality carbon credits in Gazi Bay here in Kenya. So at Mikokopamoja, we believe that conservation can only be effective it, if it benefits both the environment and the people. That's why we work very closely with the local community to ensure that they have a stake in the management and protection of this valuable ecosystem. And also here in Mikokopamoja, the project is being managed by three groups. We have Mikokopamoja Community Organization that consists of two local villages, that is Gazi and Makongeni, co-managing the mangrove forest in the area. So this organization, it has an elected committee of 13 members coming from two villages. The committee is the act as the managing entity of the projects to ensure that everyone in the community gets equal opportunities coming from the project. And we have the other organization, the other supporting group called Kenfree, Kenya Marine Fisheries Research Institute. It's the technical team. It's a government agency that is mandated to carry out research in a part environment so that they can provide technical support to the project. And also we have the ACES Association for Coastal Ecosystem Services that work hand in hand with Mikokopamoja in marketing and also there are some of the developers of the Mikokopamoja project. At Mikokopamoja, we believe that protecting our environment is everyone's responsibility. That's why we, we have made it our mission to empower locals to create positive changes by collaboration, innovation, education. Uh, this collaboration creates a sense of ownership. It also creates a it fosters co social cohesion and uh, and um, and uh, evaluation. So through this collaboration, we ensure that these uh, uh, the community they have a stake in managing these uh, critical ecosystems. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for that explanation uh, about the Mikoko Pomoja project and and the critical role it plays um, in protecting the mangroves in in um, the Gazi uh, Bay area. Um, so. Now, tourism can play a role, um, as Felipe, you were mentioning, in protecting these uh, important ecosystems. They have, you know, um, inadvertently been destroyed because they haven't been seen as um, a, having a real value. Um, but we do know that it does have a real value. So um, you have been involved in numerous projects in raising awareness campaigns, um, in creating very specific community and guest awareness campaigns, immersive experiences, and the actual conservation of these blue carbon ecosystems such as seagrass. So can you tell us a bit more about um, a, what these projects entails? What has been um, the actual improvement of the experience for the guests, for the community, for the health of the ecosystems? And, and yeah, and, and just provide some um, some insight and some inspirations for other uh, businesses to also, you know, uh, follow um, these, this path of restoration. Definitely, sure. So um, to start off with, every Six Senses property has what we call our sustainability fund. And this uh, consists of 0.5% of the total revenue, in addition to donations and in-house bottle water sales, soft boy sales and, and other profits. And this fund can only be spent outside the hotel. Um, and we look for projects that are either environmental projects or social projects that are local to the hotel. 
So this is how we facilitate, facilitate our impact in, in these projects. We use this fund and then we partner with other organizations that are, are working there. And when it comes to a habitat project, we always take a step back and look where we can have the most impact. And examples of blue carbon projects that we're doing at Six Senses Yao Noi in Thailand, uh, we have a mangrove boardwalk that goes through the mangroves and the guests get to use it as an educational opportunity, but you also bring community groups and school groups there. So the main topic there is education about these habitats. Whereas at Six Senses Fiji, we have a community mangrove restoration project as well. Um, whereas in Maldives, it needed a very different approach. And we found out that after we did the, we did a survey to find out why, why seagrass was being removed. And it was purely for the aesthetic reasons in the hotel. Um, so when we found that out, we decided we needed a very different approach. We needed a total perception change and a, and a cultural change. Um, so what we did is we uh, collaborated with Blue Marine Foundation and we generated a digital general manager's guide. And in there, it had lots of information about what is seagrass, how it can be an asset to your business. It also had links for guest education as well to make sure that the guests got involved. And this could be things like seagrass presentation templates, um, a briefing for a seagrass snorkel, videos and photos and all of those kind of things to get the guests really involved. Um, and then after that, we did a social media campaign and we focused on the topics that we thought would be most important to tourism. Um, and these were uh, seagrass as a fishery habitat um, and a fish nursery. Um, turtles as well, because obviously everyone loves turtles. Turtles are very important to the tourism industry. Um, diversity in the seagrass, so we're talking sharks, rays, seahorses, and also finally we touched on climate change and how it could be a, a positive business model for your, for your hotel as well. Um, we also invited international seagrass experts to give talks um, or to the guests, but also to the local community, and we also did these online so that everyone in the country could, could learn more about seagrass. Um, and we started to develop a national monitoring protocol so we could actually learn about seagrass in the country as well. Um, so that's quite a lot of different things, a lot of different angles to take to, to get involved. Um, but we really wanted to convince uh, other resorts to protect their meadows. And we wanted them to protect at least 80% of their meadows was what we asked for the pledge. Um, and the outcome of that, the, the positive change was that we had a huge amount of interaction on social media. And um, we also got 27% of all Maldives resorts to um, support the campaign and pledge to protect their meadows. And collectively, this was nearly 100,000 square meters of seagrass that was pledged as protected through the social media campaign. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, um, with the Ministry of Tourism, they also endorsed the campaign and they removed the recommendation to, to remove um, seagrass from, they removed the recommendation to remove seagrass from tourist resorts. Um, so all of this builds up, but it's only scratching the surface. Obviously, there's a lot of different ways you can, you can get involved and with this long-term perception change, you really got to play the long game. And I'm sure this is what Robin might talk about in a moment is that now that the Maldives government has emissions targets that are very ambitious, it might end up being money and blue carbon credits that end up protecting these habitats rather than a slow change of perception, um, seeing as, as climate is ever more important. So that's a couple of examples from, from what we're doing, but I think the key thing is education, getting people involved, getting the community support and building the knowledge as well. That's very exciting and congratulations. I mean, the impact of protecting 27% of the seagrass, that's that's incredible and that should be really inspiring um, because businesses can also uh, generate awareness and, and actually drive a change. So actually having the government change the policy, that's, that's I think, um, huge as well. So, so thank you for that, um, that example. It's, it's amazing. Now, additionally, you know, business can be, besides not everybody can have, you know, can, you know, has the, the, I guess the opportunity to take it upon themselves, like um, Six Senses did. But um, businesses can also take climate action by first reducing their carbon footprint, well, measuring and reducing their carbon footprint, and ultimately supporting carbon financing um, and offsetting projects to reduce those additional emissions that they cannot um, a, that are remaining. So, Robin. Give us, can you give us further insight as to what is carbon finance and why is it important? You know, how carbon offsetting works, of course, and then why is it so important and critical um, for the climate emergency? Absolutely. Um, so climate finance or carbon offsetting is 
effectively um, a, a buyer, that could be a, a person or a business, um, or even something like an event, uh, paying to offset or compensate for their carbon footprint uh, by buying carbon credits, which are generate uh, 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 verified units of carbon reduction produced by a project. So this isn't only limited to blue carbon or even environmental conservation. It's something that can be done through things like funding energy, renewable energy initiatives, um, or implementing fuel efficient cook stoves, any activity that can dem like dem demonstrate that it, it lowers um, or it, it um, prevents carbon being uh, released into the atmosphere or absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. So in a blue carbon context, uh, this can be split into either protection or restoration. So by protecting um, blue carbon ecosystems, what you have to do to, to be able to generate carbon credits is to demonstrate that the baseline scenario, the kind of business as usual scenario, is, um, is harmful to the environment so that there's, a, a, there's degradation happening. And then you have to demonstrate that you, through your project interventions, can reverse that trend um, and help the environment recover. So um, in the Makoka Moja project, there was a reduction of about one to two percent of Kenya's mangroves every single year, which sounds quite small, but year on year that really builds up and leads to a loss of, I think Kenya lost something like 30 percent of its mangroves um, since the 1980s. So, um, so we, we um, you, you measure that that baseline scenario, and then you develop develop projects um, in conjunction with, with the community, as as Kasim was discussing, that will get local people on board to change their activities and their habits and, and how they access firewood, for example, uh, to to allow that mangrove forest to recover. And in doing so, you demonstrate that that your interventions have this carbon benefit, um, and that carbon benefit is then um, kind of uh, converted into to carbon credits, which are sold on the carbon market. Um, so that's the the, the um, environment, the kind of recovery side of things. You can also restore the forest through either through natural regeneration or, or through planting more commonly, um, and the carbon benefit generated by those new trees that you plant. And, and if they survive, you can claim the carbon for them and, and again sell the, the carbon to buyers who want to offset the carbon footprint. Um, so as Paloma, you mentioned, and Pip, you also mentioned earlier, the key part here is that carbon credits are not a first choice solution. So um, you can't just kind of, well, you, sh you shouldn't uh, calculate your, car your carbon footprint and buy offsets to compensate for that. The key things first are to reduce um, your, your avoidable emissions. So look at your energy sources. Can you decarbonize those? Can you reduce your activities? things like that to re reduce as far as possible. But the key thing just now is that we aren't there as a society to be able to actually reduce all of our, our carbon emissions as a whole. And so carbon offsetting is, um, is a solution in the meantime to compensate for those um, unavoidable emissions. Um, you also asked why it's important. So um, Makoka Moja is one of not very many certified blue carbon projects worldwide. Um, I think there's probably fewer than 10. Um, there's a lot more in the terrestrial environment, but not many in blue carbon. Um, and it's it, it takes a special kind of set of circumstances to, to uh, develop and, and to run a, a successful blue carbon project, which is why there are so few. But to those that make it work, it's a very sustainable and predictable source of income for the community. Um, and for, for environmental restoration. So rather than the typical conservation model of, of kind of applying for grants, um, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a way of getting nature to pay for itself and demonstrating a value on nature that um, brings money in uh, reliably and sustainably to the local community and to fund the, the uh, restoration and conservation. Right. So um, besides, you know, actually trying to reduce, you know, and decarbonize um, your operations, actually supporting these projects is also a supporting the conservation of these very important ecosystems and supporting these communities as well that um, are also disproportionately uh, being affected by climate change. So it's um, it's it's a two way um, a road. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's the key of also the conversation that we're having today that is a worthwhile also activity to support um, these, these type of, um, of projects. Um, so 
with that said, also, I mean, just along those um, those lines that we're talking about, you know, the um, carbon offsettings and, and the ethics around carbon offsetting. And um, there's a lot of question when it comes to the validity of these crediting frameworks may leading leading to confusion and maybe some mistrust in the market. So, Robin, I know you have a lot of research experience around this topic. And so can you please, you know, tell us, tell the audience, those of us that are not experts in the field, how can we decipher this issue? Sure, it's, it's a question that we talk about a lot, then it's, it's not easy at all. The carbon offsetting, the kind of climate finance world is hugely complex and, and there's a huge amount of information out there. There are also, um, is it can be quite a contentious topic. Um, there are examples that have been done badly in the past, which has kind of muddied the, the reputation for carbon offsetting, which I think is a shame because it can also be done really well, which is, is the really important part here. Um, so it's maybe important first to, to explain how uh, how you get accredited to be just to sell carbon offsets. Um, so there are several standards around about I think between five and ten international standards that you can be accredited to to sell carbon offsets. Um, so we are with the Plan Vivo Foundation. Um, they're a small NGO based here in Scotland, uh, where we are based, and their priority is poverty alleviation. So carbon credits is almost like the vehicle um, to achieving that, that, that goal. Um, so they're huge on uh, the co-benefits of, of carbon. Um, so poverty alleviation obviously is the main one, but also biodiversity benefits, soil conservation, water conservation, things like that. So you basically have to choose one of these standards that you think your project aligns uh, best to. And then to get accredited through the standards, you have to produce a number of, of technical documents detailing how you will uh, kind of develop and design and run your project. So that includes everything from how you will engage in, and involve and consult the local community to how you're assessing the baseline scenario to what your interventions will be. Um, you know, how you might solve grievances, everything about your project has to be submitted to and approved by these standards. So um, they're, they're very stringent standards, which is one of the reasons why um, there are so few blue carbon projects is that um, actually achieving certification is a huge uh, burden in itself that requires a lot of time, a uh, lot of technical skills, and importantly, a lot of money, which is a, a big hurdle for most projects to get over. Um, but it does give you this uh, kind of stamp of approval effectively from the standards that, that your project meets those standards. It, it complies with their requirements and their, their recommendations and everything um, to, to be a, a project under that standard. And then there's a third uh, kind of player in the, the scenario that's the, the verifier or the validator. And that's a third party body that are approved by the standard to go in and uh, basically check that everything that you've told the standard that you're doing is, is correct. Um, yeah, make sure that everything's been done properly and then basically be that independent third eye on the project to, to make sure everything's been done well. So that's the standard element is, is probably your first part of call when you're looking to assess whether a project is high quality or not. Um, every standard obviously has their own um, their own kind of uh, ethos and their own priorities. So it's worth looking into those and, and checking which kind of best aligns with, with what you're looking for. Um, so like I said, Plan Vivo's main priority is, is poverty alleviation, uh, but it does deal with the, the smaller end of, of projects. So if you're looking for you know, hundreds to thousands of, of uh, hundreds of thousands of credits, you're best to looking at one of the, the larger um, standards or projects under the larger standards like Vera or um, some of the other standards. Um, and actually I'd refer back here to what Kasim was talking about in terms of the community and, and their importance in the project um, in, in how you assess um, how, how good a project is. Because I think the community community involvement, community benefit, community governance is, is really the, the, the most important part of a project. Even, I think, over and above is, is carbon benefit, is how does it involve local people and does it benefit them? So looking at are local people involved in governance, are they benefiting from the project? Do people have local opportunities? Is there a sense of cohesion in the project? So local people have a genuine stake in the project rather than kind of community consultation just being a tick box exercise at the start of the project. I think that's that's a key element. Um, and then every buyer, everyone who's, who's looking to offset might have their own um, priorities as well. So biodiversity might be a, a key priority to some buyers and that might be something that you look to explore with the project. 
Um, but I would say as, as um, a, a seller of carbon credits, I would say to, to buyers, get in touch with, with whoever you're buying from, ask for a conversation, um, ask questions, probe them, push them, just, you know, um, I think it is really important that buyers themselves have that level of, of diligence and investment and, and understanding of the project, rather than just looking for that, that, that kind of tick box to say, yes, we've, we've offset our carbon. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so in, in, in reality, like you said, um, carbon offsets as a mechanism, is, it's not, hasn't been around that long. It's only started in, in 1989 with the first um, a project in, in Guatemala, which was a forestry project. And the technology that we had back then has evolved greatly. Um, so, of course, you know, newer projects, uh, newer methodologies that are coming you know, to play are going to be more and more rigorous, um, like the uh, blue carbon methodologies is fairly new. Um, and there are not that many uh, registries that are actually um, actually supporting blue carbon uh, projects. But um, there is a, a third party task force that is also uh, validates these different methodologies that are being um, uh, created by the different registries. So there is a rigorous mechanism, but it goes two ways. You know, the projects need to be, you know, very well developed, but also the buyers, you know, should be knowledgeable um, as to uh, what they're trying to what they're trying to get and also if it fits the criteria of their own ethos as well. So thank you, thank you for that um, a, a explanation and I hope that it's becoming more and more clear that it is a complex environment um, in these, these carbon markets. But I want to continue to touch upon you know the community aspect of these of these projects. Um, no, so beyond beyond the climate um, change, a crisis that we are experiencing globally and you know losing these important ecosystems there's also the issue of climate justice which is there's a disproportionate impact of climate change on low income communities worldwide um and so these people that are the least responsible for the problem are the ones that are being affected the most so these carbon projects especially the ones you know like um plan vivo that really have a component in working with um, local communities, empowering them and supporting them, um, it's it's really critical as well for the well-being of of the world. But Kasim, I would like to hear from you again. You know, and tell us about you know um, a, how the project has been proved local people's lives. In how many families has a, the Mikoko uh, Pamoja project has supported? And can you give us examples of how people's lives have changed since the start of this project? Uh, thank you, Paloma. Entirely, the project has been successful in delivering biodiversity, climate, and livelihood to the coastal communities in Kenya. So, Gazi Bay is typically a fishing community living a subsistence lifestyle with limited agriculture. Through Mikoko Pamoje, we have seen some benefits obtained through conservation. As we continue conserving this critical ecosystem called mangroves, currently we have a lot of fish in our area. I wish one day you come and then uh, we cook for you some parrot fish and rabbit fish here in Gazi. So Mikoko Pamoja has been successful in, sub, uh, in supporting conservation, whereby we have a lot of fish in our area and also supporting livelihoods. Focusing on the issue of carbon credits, in Mikoko Pamoja, we have a beneficiary structure, whereby it shows transparency about the project, how the money flows. Uh, for the followers, you can visit our project design, the project design document whereby you can see how the flow of money is done in, at Mikoko Pamoja. So this beneficiary structure, we have to cater some money for each activity, like for restoration. We do cater 32% for restoration to support the restoration, restoration activity every year. And we have 36% for restoration and we have 32 percent which is meant for community development projects and we have five percent which is meant for office expenses and then we have 21 percent which is meant for community wages and also we do retain six percent every year for verification whereby we do send a, a, the plan vivo they send a verifier after every five years to do validation in our project so we usually organize for a community gathering whereby we tell the community how the money shall be spent we tell the community like this year, we have received 26,000 US dollars. So how the community, they're the ones who decide on how the money shall be spent. Uh, actually, at Mikoko Pamoja, water was a scarce resource in our area. At least currently, the women, they are no longer 
finding difficulties in obtaining water. We have installed water pipes, water towers, and also everyone currently in the village, both in Gaza and Makongen, is having a water tap in his or her home. Also, we have been able to support education. We have been able to renovate classrooms in both villages, that is Gazi and Makongeni. Also, we have been able to donate books, both in Gazi and Makongeni, because the project mainly focuses in, within two local villages. And also, we have been able to support health, which uh, uh, we have been able to support by medication, also donating books in our, in, our, in our area. And also, we have been able to support sports, because, uh, you know, sports is a good thing to protect our children from drug abuse. So Mikoko Pamoja has also been able to address those issues, helping our community entirely. Thank you. Excellent. And how many families are being supported? Uh, more than 230 households have been impacted by Mikoko Pamoja. Amazing. And Robin, do you have anything you want, and you want to add? Oh, I think Kasim explained that really well. Um, yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, so that's that's really fascinating. You know, I love hearing about you know the actual impact you know to the communities. You know, the real what's really happening down on the ground, and you know how it's been. You know, these mechanism has been supporting. Um, you know, in food security, you mentioned there's more fish in the water. So this is this is excellent um, impact that we see from from this project, which has only been around for a few years. As far as how how long has it been around? gone 10 years now okay all right <laughs> I apologize I thought um I thought it was sooner um but that's that's really great um impact now you know along the lines of this um a, you know this additional mistrust mistrust that there is when it comes to a sustainability claims um, there's a lot of media scrutiny um, that is undermining some sustainability efforts. And this has led to a new phenomenon that is now called green hushing. And what that means is that um, businesses are actually underreporting their sustainability practices in order to avoid being blamed for greenwashing, which you know means that you know you're actually claiming something that is that is not real or you're just not doing enough. So instead of bragging about their eco-friendly activities, their, you know, climate action, um, companies are just, you know, not talking about it. So, um, Philippa, Six Senses has, is clear leader um, when it comes to sustainable accommodations um, across the world, and um, they don't mind bragging about it. So, can you give us some advice um, to the tour operators? What's the right way to go about um, telling the story? Great, thanks. And um, yeah, it is a really complex situation, isn't it? It's almost an overcompensation reaction to um, to greenwashing, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I would say what makes us com confident to talk about our project, particularly our, our community and environmental projects, is the fact that we always partner with organisations and they could be uh, local government, local governments, they could be NGOs, they could be universities, um, whoever it is, we always partner with someone who has the knowledge about the project. We don't try and do it just as the hotel or just six senses on its own. And that gives us that assurance that we are doing the right thing and that, and that our project is validated. Um, so I would definitely recommend anyone to, to find a good partner. And that helps you avoid any projects that end up just being superficial. Um, it gives you the, the strategy and the planning forward that if you're not just going to, to go to a, a seller and buy credits, if you want to do a project yourself and get it verified, um, you know that you've got that backing behind you to, to give that evidence. And um, that's actually one of the reasons Six Senses hasn't yet gone into carbon offsets. We're a little bit hesitant. And the reason being, first, we've still got some work to do in terms of reducing our energy consumption, reducing our water consumption, making sure our supplier chain is as sustainable as possible before we move into it, exactly as Robin said, and as you mentioned, Verma. Um, and then we will need to find a really good partner that we can go with to validate our project. Um, from our side, we want to make sure that the majority of our money isn't invested in overheads and certification fees. We want to make sure that the money goes into the actual restoration project or what we're trying to do. Um, and then it goes on to the reporting as well. Um, Robin touched on it too, but the a restoration project isn't planting mangroves. A restoration project isn't planting trees. It's actually restoring that habitat. And there's a huge amount of validation and, and research that has to go on with it. You might have planted a lot of trees, but there's no wildlife there. So it's not it's not the same as it was previously, potentially. 
So having a really good partner and um, taking your time to make sure you, you're entering a really valid project that's not superficial, I would, would highly recommend. Excellent. That's that's really the key. You know, as long as they're not superficial projects, if you really believe in what you're doing, you should be talking about it. You know, if there's substance, then there is a lot to to say about it. And, and it's important to talk about it, to inspire others, you know, to do more as well. Um, so so thank you for that. So um, that be, we've, we've covered a lot in in the session, but now I really want to leave it um, for the audience um, a, to answer the questions, you know, particularly from the audience. So we're going to take Take, you know, the last, you know, 10, 12 minutes um, to answers to get some questions. So the first question is, um, do you feel like carbon offsetting could potentially be um, perpetuating the climate emergency because it is not addressing the root cause of our CO2 emissions? Well, um, who wants to take that? Robin? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, this is a, a, a question that's commonly asked. You know, I mentioned that carbon offsetting can be a contentious issue, and this is probably the key argument that, that people make um, against carbon offsetting. It's called the, the kind of permit to pollute um, argument that simply by buying offsets, we can just carry on um, as normal, um, polluting the environment and um, simply shifting the problem elsewhere. Um, it's a really good question. I think it's, you know, on the, on the face of it, that that could happen um, if if everybody is just looking for kind of cheap um, offsets without looking to reduce their their um, carbon footprint first, as we've said already, reducing first is, is really the key element here. Um, I think it's the responsibility of primarily the, the sellers of, of carbon offset, offsets, the, the kind of project developers, anybody who's selling uh, carbon offsets, to make sure that they're not facilitating that happening. So as ACs, we have um, a, a kind of code of conduct for our buyers. We look to, we, we look, look to make sure that uh, all of our buyers are, first of all, reducing their, their carbon footprint um, before they, they, they come to us to, to offset. Um, we have what's called the three P's, which is, is kind of our statements um, in terms of the, the order of importance that um, different actions should take in the fight against the, the climate emergency. So first of all, it's political change is the most important element. Second of all, it's personal reductions. And third and, and last, it's, it's paying to offset that, that residual unavoidable emissions. Um, I think, um, yeah, it's it's... You know, as a society, we are moving towards a, a low carbon society, not nearly as fast as as we would like to, or, or most or anybody in this room, assuming uh, would like to, and not nearly as fast as we should be doing. So there's uh, inevitably going to be residual emissions that we can't reduce. So looking at myself personally, I would love to buy an electric car and, and scrap my, my petrol engine car, but I can't afford to. And if I look at the cost of buying an electric car, it's, you know, 15, 20,000 pounds more to buy an electric car than, than to buy my, my petrol engine, which I just can't afford. And so if I took that 20,000 uh, that, that I might have, and so, you know, where else can I put that to reduce my carbon footprint? It could be better spent elsewhere, whether it's on offsets or just paying projects that, that um, you know, do environmental restoration and, and protection um, to, to compensate for, for emissions. Um, I think it's it's a, a failing of our, of our society that we're not at a position uh, or, or, the, or that we're still at a position where those residual um, emissions exist. And I think for me, a, a big kind of moment of realization in this was the kind of post lockdown, post COVID uh, rush to to kind of get back on planes and travel again. You know, there's all this talk of is this the new normal? Maybe we're not going to travel. Um, and then the the post rush really proved that we need to travel as as a as a society. Travel is is something that's so important to us and something that is going to continue. And I think it would maybe be naive to keep saying we need systemic change. We need to just not travel or not do this or or completely cut our carbon emissions. When in fact we realistically we're not doing that as a society. And if carbon offsetting can fill a gap in the meantime, it's by no means a permanent solution. We see it as ACs, we see it in, in the kind of maybe 20 to 30 years time, we would like to see carbon offsetting being made redundant and we are actually at that zero carbon society. Uh, but in the meantime, it, it plays that critical gap in compensating for the emissions that we can't actually reduce. 
Very, very well said. I couldn't have said it better. Um, and I just want to add a little bit on uh, to that. There's a recent report by Silvera um, that actually um, a discusses and looks into different organizations and their climate action um, a trajectory. And they what they've uncovered is that actually businesses that um, have made the most contribution towards carbon offsetting has actually made the higher contribution towards a carbon reduction. So it goes hand in hand. And it's like what Filippo was saying as well, you know, businesses that are really engaged in taking climate action, they take the steps, you know, on um, the right steps towards, you know, reduction um, and changing, doing systematic changes, conservation, and ultimately um, supporting these, these uh, carbon uh, projects. So there is a, way, a right way uh, to do this. It's not, it's not a license to pollute, but thank you for that. So let's take the next um, question. How do you evaluate your performance over time? What are the indicators of success um, for this carbon credit project? Um, so this is you know, particularly the um, a Mikoko a project. And a, Kasim, do you want to take this question? Come up again. Do you want to take this question? How do you evaluate your performance over time? What are the indicators of success in the carbon credit project? Okay, thank you. So we usually uh, do monitoring uh, twice a year, whereby we do um, estimation, we do measurement of each mangrove. So we have to set a transect of 10 by 10 meters in permanent plots and also in temporary plots. So in that transect, we usually measure the damage of each tree so that we can assess the amount of carbon stored in each tree. In the transect or in the or in our operational area, we usually uh, look for the uh, stamps count. So when we have a lot of stamps, which means that the forest is being degraded. So we need to ensure that there is no cutting down of the of the trees, so that we have minimal stamps. So when we have a lot of stamps, it means that there is a lot of destruction happening in our area, and also we do minimize the leakage by establishing an alternative, whereby we set by planting fast growing terrestrial trees like the Kashorina, which were introduced in Australia. So they take about five years for, to mature. So through this, we can reduce the issue of the leakage. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Thank you for that explanation. The next question is, um, how does Six Senses communicate their sustainable initiatives to their guests? or integrate sustainable education into their guest stay? Thanks, good question. And um, it all comes down to the experience embedded in. So we always have a sustainability manager or sustainability director on our staff that will be on the property all the time. And they're constantly running workshops or they're around for guest touch points all of the time. Um, properties where we have specific conservation initiatives, uh, we have marine biologists on the staff as well that will the resident marine biologists. And every day they offer different activities where they engage with the guests, um, but they're also just present at the hotels for, um, for guests to interact with all of the time. So any of our activities, we try and make sure that it's, it's got some kind of educational value or some kind of additional value to it. For example, um, we do sunset cruises, but we have a marine biologist on the, on the sunset cruise to look at the dolphins. They're also using it as an opportunity to record dolphin sighting data. And we always talk to the guests about that as well. So um, it's kind of impossible to, in lots of our properties to not be in nature. We're in locations where there's a lot of nature around. Um, so any interaction with a guest is an opportunity to, to provide some kind of education. And we also make sure that we train all of our staff so that they can communicate these projects well, um, whether it's someone from housekeeping or FMB or engineering, um, they all go to these training sessions. We also do host events like host snorkels or host jungle walks so that all of the staff on board can clearly communicate these projects to our guests. And I think it happens quite successfully. It's really a key part of, of things that we, we do at the resort. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for that. The next question is, what is your opinion about seaweed harvesting to make bioplastics? This is fascinating because I love innovation, but I don't know anything about this. You guys, um, anyone can take this? I guess I can. <laughs> I don't know, Robin, if you know. Okay, no, I was going to say, I hope that you do, because I don't. 
Um, yeah, I think it's like, because obviously with any aquaculture, you've got to make sure that the, the industry of it isn't having any other negative impacts. For example, um, like that seaweed harvesting has a lot of lines, I believe, and that could cause entanglement issues. It's also using seabed floor space. Um, so all these things have to be taken into consideration, obviously, when when the harvesting happens. But seaweeds and macroalgae are a really great generation of um, they can generate a lot of biomass for whether it's food harvesting or if it's generated into bioplastics. I don't know what that process is to get from seaweed to bioplastics. Um, but in terms of the aquaculture and developing itself, it obviously, as long as it's done sustainably and responsibly and within the means, um, then it could be a good way to go. Excellent. Yeah, I mean, and there's we also have the sargassum problem in in the Caribbean. I don't know if it's uh, if it's the same or has the same properties, but there's also a lot of work um, a, to do some you know bio some other bio products out of that. You know, a, this you know creating an issue into into a solution. Um, but yeah, I love innovation, and as long as it's done you know well, like you mentioned, then it can be um, a positive solution. So another question for Philippa, um, what are the areas that hotels should absolutely not overlook on the road towards sustainability? Uh, I think there's a lot, but the main ones, of course, we're looking at energy consumption, water consumption, and waste management, I think are our key three topics to make, to make your properties more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, looking at look at it, alternatives to any diesel generators or going off grid, making sure you're using your solar or rege renewable energy. Um, I would say these key topics are sometimes the hardest to tackle, but also the ones where you can have the most impact. Um, particularly with waste management in the tourism industry, it's there's a reputation for a lot of waste, particularly food waste. And um, something that Six Senses does is all of our properties have an organic garden. And all of our food waste goes into compost, which then feeds the garden, which then goes back into the kitchen. So having this circle um, means that we can avoid we can avoid a lot of that waste. Excellent. Um, so can you mention some valuable case studies of tourism businesses that successfully invested in um, NBS to protect ecosystems? So. Invested in what? Sorry, NBS. NBS uh, to protect ecosystems. What's NBS? No, nature-based solutions. Nature-based oh, okay. NBS. Sorry, NBS. <laughs> Nate, NBS. thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> um, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Six Senses is a great example. What was the question? Sorry, nature-based solutions to achieve. Yeah. To achieve a, what? ecosystem so business tourism businesses that have successfully done um a yeah invested in nature-based solutions yeah definitely i guess i guess there's lots of examples for coastal protection in terms of making sure mangroves are are protected as well as biodiversity um i'm trying to think of specific examples that aren't i haven't already used um i don't know robin jump in if you can think of an example off the top of your head <laughs> <laughs> I'm just racking my brains to think of if I know of any specific examples. Um, Use nature-based solutions to protect ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, I've seen examples, you know, in 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 some of the islands, some of the barrier islands in Fiji, for example. I can't, you know, name specific ones, um, but you know, there's there's a lot of different because also a, of the need because they are in already remote areas, you know, such as Six Senses, like you mentioned, you were in already, um, you know, places that are already in the environment. Um, so they need to really um, work with the environment and protect the environment to actually provide, um, a, you know good experiences but I've seen good and bad examples and I'm I can't name you know very specific ones um but I have seen you know a, you know some good examples in in some of these barrier islands in in the Pacific Islands I mean we, we also have a coral regeneration projects at multiple of our properties um and the basis of that again goes back to assessing what is the issue for the habitat and coming up with an appropriate solution for it um whether it is active restoration whether it's protection Maybe the issue might be overfishing, in which case that's what you need to tackle. Um, maybe it's pollution going to the ocean and that's what you need to tackle. So um, with all of these different projects, you should never go in wanting to do a restoration project. You should go in, assess what the issue is 
And then if the restoration is the answer, then that's the, the route you go down. But otherwise, there might be other things that you end up doing. You might end up doing an agricultural project. You might end up doing a sustainable fisheries project in order to protect the coral reefs. That's 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 very key. Um, so I'm going to stop taking questions, you know, now um, because we are getting at the top of the hour and um, just really it's been a delightful conversation. It's been very insightful for me, hopefully for the audience as well. I think it's clear that protecting blue carbon ecosystems is critical, not only to address climate change, but climate justice, as well as climate change adaptation. And the tourism industry does have a role in recovering and protecting these valuable ecosystems. Um, carbon offsetting can be a means of supporting, you know, climate, the climate crisis, and of course, is secondary to first reduction um, and uh, eliminating, you know, the, the carbon emissions that you can at this point. Um, so I want to thank you, um, Philippa, Robin, and Kasim, for your time and for your valuable contributions in protecting blue forests and for sharing your knowledge and experience with us here today. So thank you, everyone who has uh, been attending for active listening and for providing some uh, interesting questions. Um, you can support it uh, through partnering with Sustainable Travel International. You can also support the Mikoko Pomoja project. Um, and if you want to learn more on how you can take climate action, you can scan the QR code that is um, behind me and you can sign up for a 20 minute um, conversation um, with one of our team members at Sustainable Travel International. And also a, my colleague is, is putting the link um, on in the chat box. Uh, we also are gonna send another little poll right now. Um, if you guys can help us fill us out, it will really help us um, define the topic for our next session. We really want to you know, continue to bring you some you know, insights, some real life you know, experiences. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, please fill out uh, the poll and, and stay tuned for more interesting you know, webinars um, and you know, additional information and educational materials that uh, we continue to put out um, around this very important topic. So thanks, thanks again, guys, um, for for your contribution. It's been it's been great speaking to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, and thank you everyone for attending and for all the interesting questions. Good questions. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Paloma. Thank you, Kasim. I know you had some problems. Great that you've been in and out. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's uh, ex excellent. Um, yeah. So thank you, everyone, for for attending. I think the um, the poll is still is still up. And um, yeah, we have some good feedback already. Good webinar. <laughs> so good information. And this webinar is going to be um, available online as well. So uh, you can share that information as well um, uh, with others if you think it will be valuable for them to learn more about this, this topic. And let's see, what do we have? The next topic people want to learn more about, I think it's in between emerging climate solutions and carbon accounting. Carbon accounting and measurement, that's um, that's interesting. Thank you again. And I will give you back um, the last two minutes of the top of the hour. We did, we did great timing, um, I'm happy. So thanks again. Bye-bye.